Hi, welcome back to the Food Forest. Today's video could very well save your life. It's not an exaggeration. Please watch this video till you understand it, and then please develop plans in order to protect yourself and your family. <coughs> So this morning I woke up and I checked the news and I saw this graph. This graph shows what the wet bulb temperature is across portions of the United States during this actual heat wave. Now these numbers are really, really scary and I think a lot of people don't understand why. Now in some circles this has actually been picked up that this is actually going to kill a lot of people and it might but it's not as bad as those people think. And the reason is that this chart is actually not the wet bulb temperature, this is the wet bulb globe temperature. In this video I'm going to explain what dry bulb is which is what we typically measure and what you think of when you read the weather forecast. But then I'm going to explain also what wet bulb temperature is and what wet bulb globe temperature is. These are really important to know in the... These things are going to be really important to understand in the future that we're going into. And it'll help you understand why things like scientists saying that we have to keep things to 1.5 degrees global warming is really important. Hopefully this is a service that I can provide to you as an engineer. I have to actually learn this stuff. So I can help explain it and I'm going to try to explain it in a way that you can understand because it's really complicated. So let's get to the complicated definition of what wet bulb temperature is and then I'll explain what it means. The wet bulb temperature is the temperature that a volume of air would reach if allowed to come to saturation through evaporative cooling of water being allowed to adiabatically evaporate into it. So wrap your head around that. So a key term in there is adiabatic. That means that all the cooling is taking place through a transfer from energy to work. So forget about that, you don't need to know about that. Having it cool by evaporation to saturation means that that volume of air will get to 100% humidity. This also means that the wet bulb temperature is always going to be lower than the actual measured temperature via a dry bulb unless the temperature of the air is actually already saturated in which point no further evaporation can actually help cool it. To make sense of this, the dry bulb temperature is if I have a thermometer and I'm measuring the outside air. That's just the temperature of the air. Wet bulb temperature can be measured by wrapping that same thermometer in a saturated wet towel and allowing that to come to equilibrium temperature. So for example, let's look at our dry air. If we actually had dry air and we measured it, and then we wrap the thermometer in a wet towel, because the air outside is really dry, the moisture would actually evaporate out of the wet towel, and that's how human cooling works. When we sweat, the evaporation actually draws heat off of our skin, because heat is required to evaporate the water off of our skin, the sweat. So when that dry bulb thermometer is wrapped in a wet cloth, and the water evaporates out of it, it actually will cool the actual thermometer so if you're measuring 140 Fahrenheit outside, then after the water evaporates, you're actually going to be measuring slightly cooler. This is why a really dry heat in, for example, Arizona can feel drastically different than a very wet heat where I live near the Great Lakes region or say in like the Carolinas. Now usually temperatures aren't given to people in the wet bulb temperature. It's more of a measurement thing that meteorologists and scientists use tell people that a wet bulb temperature is 95 degrees, they actually think, okay, that's not so bad. 95 is not bad. 95 wet bulb temperature is actually lethal. And a wet bulb temperature of 95 Fahrenheit or 35 Celsius being lethal is something that a lot of people don't know. Okay, so now that you understand what wet bulb is, I can explain what wet bulb globe temperature is. Wet bulb globe temperature takes into account two other things. So wet bulb globe temperature is a weighted mix. 70% of the wet bulb globe temperature is just the wet bulb temperature, but 20% of it is then a globe temperature. This is a temperature taken from a globe thermometer which only measures solar irradiation. And then 10% of it is actually the dry bulb temperature, the temperature that you would get if you just measured it with a thermometer outside. So what that means is 70% of the temperatures in this map is made up from the wet bulb temperature, but 20% is from the globe temperature and 10% is from the dry bulb temperature. So it's a little bit higher than the actual true wet bulb temperature. 
Now the reason why 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit wet bulb temperature will kill you is that the only way that our human body has the ability to regulate our temperature is through evaporative cooling, through sweating. When I'm sitting in a hot environment and my body temperature is around between 95 and 98 Celsius, it's actually been coming down with the more preservatives that we have in our food, believe it or not. So human body is actually cooling because our base metabolic rate is actually cooling. So we have less energy in our body warming it up. Because we ingest a lot of things like fructose and corn syrup. These things mess with our core temperature by changing the way that ATP in our cells is generated. But we actually are cooling as we eat more of these uh, foods with preservatives and uh, corn syrup and fructose. So the more fast food that you eat, typically the cooler your core body temperature will be. But small tangent aside, if I'm in an environment with about 95 Fahrenheit, what actually happens is my body brings that equilibrium, just like a layer of air right around my body. It brings it to roughly my body's core temperature. And if I don't move at all, if I'm like steady and still and there's no wind, then this air actually can't really remove heat out of my body anymore. Now, if the entire air is 35 Celsius, 95 Fahrenheit, and so is my body, then I'm already at equilibrium with my environment. I'm not gonna lose any heat. However, if it's a dry 95 outside, I can form sweat. And I form sweat on my skin and then it evaporates out into the drier environment. And that evaporative process cools my skin layer. It actually will suck energy out of the volume of air right touching my skin and then I'm in contact, thermal contact with that volume of air and that will cause an actual cooling effect. However, when the air is already at 100% humidity, I actually can't sweat anymore. So that means I can't thermal regulate my body anymore. And something like 660 people died in the Chicago heat wave in 1995 in four hours because they temporarily hit the wet bulb temperature of lethality. Now it's only the end of June right now. We're actually getting into warmer temperatures coming up. And we're already starting to see temperatures that are getting close to that actual lethal level of 35 degree Celsius wet bulb temperature that kills people. And people will die really, really quick if this happens. And in fact, this would actually be a human mass extinction event. It's one of the only things that would kill almost everybody with like a 99.99999% lethality. What matters the most in surviving these events is actually that we have power so we can run dehumidifiers and air conditioners. So we can drop the temperature and drop the humidity so that our evaporative process works again to save our lives. It's another reason why I'm such a proponent of nuclear power to have a strong, reliable, baseload source of energy because it's going to be life and death in the future. And that's why the carbon that we put into the air actually does matter because temperatures being just a degree or two warmer during some of these mass heat events is actually the difference between everybody surviving and having a kind of crappy week and literally a giant extinction of a state. At the end of the day, physics takes over and physics doesn't care if you believe climate change is real or not. Carbon is old and store energy. And if we put it into the air and if the planet can't remove it through trees fast enough, then we're in trouble. So yes, carbon going into the air actually just causes plants to grow. It causes trees to grow faster until it doesn't. If carbon PPM in the atmosphere continues to rise, that itself is demonstrably showing that the trees and the plants of the planet can't keep up to the level that we're putting in. So yeah, for a while we were putting a lot of CO2 into the air, but it didn't really matter because the plants could handle it. So CO2 levels weren't really changing that much. But then we kept adding more and more and more to the point that we overwhelmed the planet's ability to sequester it and also did other things like wiping out forests and ecosystems that do the sequestration and also turned and tilled the soil through agriculture, which reduces the ability of the soils to hold water, which is needed in the photosynthesis equation. So we broke the water cycle and the ability for plants to actually do their job. Combining all of these things, we actually are seeing CO2 levels rise and continue to rise. So for those people who say, you know, more CO2 just grows more plants, I mean, that's totally true. And we've blown way past that. And these extra few degrees, you know, they don't only just push us above wet bulb temperatures being a bad weekend versus a thing that will kill you. 
but they actually start doing other things like melting the ice caps and releasing methane that then, you know, will raise temperature even more, but in a fun, uncontrollable way. So this video didn't intend to be a climate change rant, but you know, it's really hard to talk about things that are going to kill people without telling them, hey, we need to start trying to solve these things. What this means for you in the next few months in summer is try to keep an eye on what your wet bulb temperature is in your area. And if wet bulb temperature, not wet bulb globe temperature, but wet bulb temperature starts getting anywhere near 35 Celsius or 95 Fahrenheit, start evacuating. If you don't already, go to the store and buy a generator. Yes, burn gasoline in order to provide electricity to your house because it's literally going to be life and death. Because if these wet bulb temperatures continue to increase, then you can't even go to a public pool, for example, to cool down. But if the outside air temperature is at 35 degrees Celsius, 95 Fahrenheit, and it's at 100% relative humidity and you can't evaporate, you need air conditioning or you're going to die. It's not only that, if the outside air temperature is 110, but relative humidity is like 80% or so. I'm just guessing there what that number is, but that would bring the wet bulb temperature up to 95 Fahrenheit, even though it's like 110 outside. That would also kill you. So you don't actually need 100% relative humidity in order to die from a lethal wet bulb temperature. You just need the wet bulb temperature itself to be 95 Fahrenheit or 35. Celsius. So I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you learned some science. I hope you learned something that could potentially save your life. Something that you should keep your eye on and develop plans for emergency escape should those conditions occur. Thanks for watching.